following interview was conducted with William E. Blevins, Professor Emeritus in Diagnostic Imaging School of Veterinary Medicine for the Purdue University Oral History Program, it took place on Friday, May 28, 2010, Stewart 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Dr. Blevins, good morning, and thank, thank you. you very much. Good morning. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Sure. Um, I was born on June 6, 1944, and... Um, ah, we all remember that I, day. Well, but yeah, historians, are amazing the number of people that don't remember, but uh, <laughs> I was, I always said... You do. <laughs> I used to always say that I was a uh, replacement soul, <laughs> and uh, my wife pointed out to me, well, I thought souls didn't die. I said, well, maybe you're right. Maybe I was just a recycled soul. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, really uh, unique, right? Yeah, and I, I did have a chance... Um, Oh, in the late 80s to actually walk on Normandy Beach. Oh. A very emotional experience. And it was just incredible. Yeah. yeah. But where, about, where were you born? What city? Um, well, I, I grew up in the Fort Branch, Indiana. Uh, I was actually born in Princeton Hospital, okay. Princeton, Indiana. And um, I, had, uh, you know, I had both my parents uh, through my whole childhood, and, uh, and actually they just died recently. Um, I had one sister. With an older sister, four and a half years older than me, and uh, it was just the two of us. Uh, my father worked as a, uh, um, I guess you'd say a labor laborer at MD Packing Company, and we lived about you know, half a block from the plant. <clears throat> I actually worked there when I was uh, you know, growing up. As soon as I had a driver's license, I worked there and sure. on, on the farm and so on. Um, I... Um, what was grade school like? Was it small or very small? Okay. Yes, but, um, the uh, class sizes were probably at that time. See, in the high school, but I know it was 62 in my class, and so in grade school it would have been a little less than that because there was a uh, a Catholic school where some of the students joined us at uh, after the eighth grade, okay. so the class got a little bit bigger. Uh, so we were probably, I don't know, it's too long ago, but 40s maybe, sure. something like that. And tell us about high school, what was that like? Well, in high school, I was uh, very involved in a lot of things. You know, I was uh, athletic, so I, I played uh, basketball and football. We had eight-man football, not 11-man football, which was really a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, in eight-man football, you have to make uh, 15 yards for a first down. And between the goal lines, it's 80 yards rather than 100 feels a little more narrow, and then you played offense, then you turn around and play defense. There's no platoons, you know, so it was great. It was for small schools. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I uh, uh, played in the band. I played trumpet, baritone, and sousaphone. Um, played sousaphone mainly because they needed somebody, and I was big enough to do it. <laughs> You're it, right? Yeah, right. that's right. right. I, was, okay. I never liked it that much. I didn't ever learn the bass clef very well. With baritone, you can get the music in treble clef and bass clef, and I always read treble sure. clef. Did you do it this, uh, play at best the athletic events too? Well, that made it kind of hard if you were. Yes, and actually, there were some some events where I played when I was playing on the second team. I'd play, and then I'd come join the pep band, and I'd play then for the varsity games. But then I eventually got on the varsity, and then, of course, I couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> um, I was in uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, I made Eagle. Uh, and I was on the, uh, the, Order, the Order of the Arrow. So I was really uh, active in a lot of things. Um, my, my sister was very, very smart, had a photogenic memory, and she, she graduated valedictorian, so she always set the standard. And of course, I was interested in a lot of other things, so. You were pretty active, too, in activities. I was very active. I did graduate fourth out of 62. But, That's uh, pretty good. Yeah, it was. I felt that was good enough. What sort of program were you taking college prep or? Well, back then they didn't really have yeah. programs like that. I took, sure. uh, it was really a very good background, uh, especially in uh, math and science and chemistry. Uh, I remember. Well, those are ones you need. Yeah, I remember uh, when I went to Purdue, you know, first you know, semester in physics, I didn't have to take the final to get an A because I'd had it all in high school. Super. Yeah. And, uh, I never will forget my one of my first because I was going to, for, to to get into vet school, so I was really focused on doing well. And um, um, my first exam back in my chemistry was I got a sixty-three. I was devastated when I was high in the class, <laughs> and I just wasn't used to that sort of uh, thing sure. where they had you know, and so. Um, 
but at any rate, in, in, uh, in high school, I was very active in both sports, and, uh, and it was, you know, a good time. We had sock hops, you know. All that then. good stuff. All that yeah. good stuff, yeah. Right. And I drove a 1950 Ford that was at a planed off trunk and the mirrors in the front, you know, and the dual antennas in the back and the skirts and the cruising era. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, oh gosh, I started working when I was 15, uh, running a, a miniature golf course and uh, making snow cones and that sort of thing. And then I became a short order cook in a dog and says restaurant, you know, because I had to work to, to have any kind of money to do anything else. Sure. And um, so, uh, I, I know uh, my s junior year of high school, well, the other, there were two of us that were cooks and we both played football. And here came football season, and so I gave up one season of football so I could work, then he would work you know, during my basketball. So I really, make, now of course, wish I hadn't done that, but you know, it was <laughs> what, what we had to do to get sure. along. So I managed to graduate, and when I was a junior, um, Oh, there was one other thing. When I first, when I was a sophomore in high school, I decided I want to be a veterinarian. You know, we had a local vet who was really good people. They they didn't have any children. They just took me under their wing, and I was just there all the time. There were a lot of Saturday nights. I'd just go out there and eat popcorn and watch Gunsmoke, you know, with them. <laughs> and uh, I spent a lot of time out there. And so I was focused fairly early uh, about knowing what I wanted to do, and. Uh, and I knew it required good grades, you know, and, and so I worked very hard at uh, especially on the science courses. I uh, didn't have any biology courses in high school because I didn't offer any. And because I was doing well enough, um, I asked to do a self-taught course in biology. And I had plenty of credits, so it doesn't look like I needed anything for graduation. So uh, they allowed me to do that, and I, uh, they had some old histoplasmides slides, slides that I looked at and had got books and studied, and <laughs> I even did a, a, an exploratory laboratory on a guinea pig and sewed him up. <laughs> of course, you couldn't do any of that right now. But, uh, you know, I was really intense, uh, intensely interested in, in, uh, in what I was going to do, and I, I was accepted to Purdue uh, sometime in my junior year. Uh, and that's did I, you come down at all? Or no, uh, I didn't. I, I mean, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, there was only one veterinary school in uh, in Indiana, of course, and and I knew that the odds of getting in were best in state, and so there, was there wasn't any decision to make. So I just applied, and and I, and I got accepted. And uh, my first day on campus was uh, just. Fabulous until the last class. Um, what year was this when you entered? Well, in 1962. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, 1962, and so I um, um, think I had some of the, some biology courses uh, in Lily Hall, and, and you know, did math and some other things, and they were real simple because I had it all in high school, so it was really easy for me. And then my last class of the day was in English, and I. Uh, had this professor uh, who was standing out at the door with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, looking at us like we were scum of the earth, and he treated us that way. <laughs> and that was unpleasant. I ended up getting a B, which back then a B was a good grade. Sure, sure. You know, I, my, uh, my, uh, let me think, my index getting into vet school was like 5.2 something, and I graduated with a 5.0. Three, four, someplace in there, I don't remember. So I was a B student, you know, okay. and, and, and there were, back then there were classes, no one got A's. Of course, that's a big difference now, obviously. So uh, in pre vet, um, I, I, uh, I lived in State House, which was a co op house, and I did come up to visit them in, during my senior year to be interviewed because you had, they had to, uh, Select you to go into the. To the Where was it house. located? Yeah, well, it was on State Street. Okay. Of it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't exist it, anymore. Oh, uh, they didn't it. You know where Fowler Hall is. Sure. Well, I mean, if you go to the west end of that block, that block, that's where State that's House where, was. Okay. Okay. And uh, 
you know, the trees that they recently cut down on State Street, they were planted when I was in school. <laughs> so, uh, so I've seen them grow up and die. <clears throat> but uh, we lived in a co-op house, which was a very good experience, and it was... Um, it was sort of close to Blue Hall place. Where the fairly, was yeah. Well, I wouldn't get to bit. that in a minute, but I, I, I was only in the State House for three years. Oh, okay. And um, I figured I needed to get with some other uh, vet students to, because it was a very intense program at the time. But at any rate, I went to, I was, uh, at that time, if you recall, that would have been in the 60s, and um, all able-bodied men had to take uh, two years of ROTC. So I was in the Air Force ROTC. And here at uh, Purdue. Here at Purdue, yeah. And um, I was the, uh, um, the second year, I became uh, a pledge trainer and was first sergeant of the band. Uh, we did get to fly to uh, uh, New York's World Fair and perform there, which was quite nice. We got to uh, fly out a C-137, and I got to sit in the pilot seat and fly it for a little while. That was great. Well, you didn't really fly it, but you, they did let you steer it a little bit. That was a lot of fun. But I didn't have a lot of extracurricular activities in the pre-vet because I was focused on getting in vet school. And, uh, you know, our house had... We had what they called then trade parties, and so you would have, uh, say, another co-op house come over, uh, a women's co-op, obviously, and then you'd have to dance and whatnot. Sure. But uh, we had got a few uh, uh, Greek uh, sororities uh, that would come to our trade party, but not very many. It was mainly the women co-op uh, houses. So I, I made it in to vet school uh, after two years of pre-vet, actually it was really before the two years were over, I got, I, got, I was accepted um, December, January of my second year of pre-vet. And um, so what that meant was, all I had to do the second semester was pass my courses. So I had a good time. And I still and taking got- taking a little bit of campus life. I still got over 5 though. <laughs> it didn't seem to matter. Sure. Um, I think I had probably um, more of a difficulty with transition from college to vet school than from high school to college. Because in my first semester of college in pre-vet, I'd had most of the stuff in high school. Right. So, uh, it was a lot easier. It wasn't a big yeah, wake-up call. No, it wasn't. And it was, uh, I enjoyed, you know, it was the first time living away from home. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we had a house mother. In, in the state house that um, lived um, in a small town just about seven miles from Fort Branch. So when we went on holidays and whatnot, I would drive her back and forth. That was nice. That and so it worked out really well. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, my first time ever hitchhiking, the only one time ever in my whole life that I did any hitchhiking was the uh, time when uh, President Kennedy was uh, assassinated and Purdue closed early. I was sitting in a, getting a haircut in the town of Purdue Service Center when I heard it on the news. And, you know, everyone remembers where they were when they heard that news. So we were out early and um, I thought, well, I might as well go home and I didn't have a ride. And so I uh, had a, uh, a roommate take me out to the south side of town and I started hitchhiking. I hitchhiked to uh, Crawfordsville got out on there at uh, Highway 47, and I was waiting for another ride, and here came, up the other way, was a high school classmate going to Purdue to pick up his girlfriend, and they were going to turn around and go back. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I hopped in, went back to Purdue, and then went home. But that was, that was my total experience with, uh, with hitchhiking. Sure. So I, um, I got into Purdue, and my, uh, they were very rigorous courses. And I had to actually study, which I hadn't had to do that much before. Um, well, study hard. And I did okay. Um, I remember, I think it was the second semester, we had immunology. And um, we, back then we just had two exams, you know, midterm and the final. And at the end of the midterm, uh, the professor came up to me and says, 
well, you're the lowest in the class. Of course, I was scared to death. We, in a, throughout my veterinary school career, someone was failed every year, every four years. The first semester, we lost six. Of course, this doesn't happen that much anymore. You don't hear about that. Yeah, well, when we, they, they failed us out fairly uh, rigorously. We started with um, 56 in my class and graduated 43. Wow, yeah. that's quite a drop. Yeah. So at any rate, he tells me I'm the lowest in the class, and man, I am you not know, So I really cracked the books. And one of the problems with that particular course was the exams. I didn't understand the exams. They were, every question was two statements, statement A and statement B. And then the choices were, the multiple choice exam, A is true, B is true, and they're related. Next choice, A is true, B is true, and not related. A is true, B is false, they're related. Uh, what do you mean related? You know, I just couldn't get it. And so I studied, 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 and I finally was able to crack a C out of that course. And I was, I was never so pleased to get a yeah. C. <laughs> yeah, I'm tricky. I have a problem with that, too. Yeah, you know? yeah. So um, that was... Um, that was real difficult. This, the, the, um, I was still living in State House my first year of the vet, of vet school. And um, I just I knew that the second year was the toughest year. At least everyone says said that. So I decided I needed to get with some of the vet students. So I left the house, and there were four of us guys got together, and, and we, uh, we actually... Uh, had rented an apartment out at Whispering Winds. Uh, they're out by the by the bypass, and but the building wasn't finished yet, and there was some delay, and they didn't get finished. And so we lived in Terry Courts uh, for a while. We finally got finished, so we got we were able to move in. And see, none of us had any money, and so uh, <laughs> we 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 managed to get four sheep off of a parasitology experiment <laughs> was given to us. They were in the control group, so they didn't have anything, and we had them slaughtered. To this day, I cannot stand to eat anything that goes bad. <laughs> for, 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 uh, for a treat, we would, uh, we would buy a chicken on Saturday and have fried chicken. But, uh, but we studied together, we were able to quiz each other, and uh, it was, uh, it, you know, it worked out well. Um, those guys, two of them were smokers, and they're now both dead uh, of lung cancer. And, uh, How'd you get back and forth to campus? Because they didn't have any buses, did they? No, we had, we had, uh, car, car. Uh, we had cars. Oh, okay. That you could, you could uh, uh, we took, because we are living off campus, you could have a car. I can't remember if I had a car there or not. But you could get back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, as you probably remember um, if you lived on campus for the first two years you couldn't have a car right. and uh, then after that you could so um, went through made it through the sophomore year and then finally clinics so this is what where everyone waits for going through uh, veterinary school is to get to clinics we got to get to do something and it was fantastic um, at, at that uh, summer between the sophomore year and the junior year of vet school I got married and, uh, Did you meet your wife here? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, is she a was, student? Uh, yes, and she was um, in uh, Antridale, um, which was a women's co-op. So we met at one of those trade parties. So um, we got married. She was graduated from. Uh, hmm. She was a home ec major. Okay. And, uh, and she worked as a uh, as a. Um, Assistant Food Supervisor in Earhart Hall. Okay. So, at that time, it was, you know, we were doing well. My apartment, we were Mary Student, State Street uh, Apartments, uh, Mary Student Course. I think it cost $87 a month. I could eat at the hall every evening for $10 a month. And it was, it was fantastic. A big the help. Tuition, tuition back then, once I got in vet school, and it was higher than, than school, was uh, $225 a semester. <laughs> when I was, when my first year of college, 
I remember I, I kept track of everything that I spent, you, you know, Cokes, whatever. And it cost me less than a thousand dollars. My the tuition uh, then was 120. I had a scholarship. Uh, I think I had to pay then 75 for the you know, for the per semester for the uh, for the tuition. And uh, the house bills were it averaged 65 dollars a month, which basically room and board. Sure. So when I that. The first year, uh, and when I got married, I had fourteen dollars in the bank. So it wasn't like you know, we had lots of money. I, I did have a job working as a welder at Construction Products during the summer. Of course, I couldn't do that during the winter. Uh, but we had, we were doing okay, and uh, I even took flying lessons at Purdue Pilots. <laughs> so like our Dr. Hansen did too while he was here and yeah. got certified. <laughs> yeah, I well, I never. We had uh, some problems with the plane remaining uh, uh, certified, and because some people flew it into the ground a few times, and uh, it seems like when I was ever ready to solo, it was down, and yeah, I just never. When I graduated, I didn't have. There was a big shock about what finance was <laughs> after that. <laughs> gotcha. But um, so I went through uh, clinical years, and uh, at that time, I really didn't have a plan about what I wanted to do with my DVM. Uh, it basically, in the back of my mind, I always had the option of going back home and uh, doc, Dr. Olin Pumphrey, who was uh, the veterinarian, uh, would take me in and I could eventually own the place. You know, and I, uh, so that was um, sort of in the back of my thinking. As a matter of fact, between my junior and senior year at vet school, uh, at that time we had, they had what they called summer clinics. And so they, they split the class into thirds, and the f one third took the first half of the summer, one third took the second half of the summer, and the third third took all the vacations during the, the regular uh, semesters. And I liked to get into the, the, the vacation group because it allowed me all summer to be down home, sure. and I worked in that practice. And uh, I really I enjoyed it. I did some surgeries there that they had never done before. I did, did a diaphragmatic hernia repair, and uh, uh, this was all uh, pro bono for the client because I was obviously not sure. <laughs> licensed or anything. Was this practice a small animal and large as well? It was small and large, that's right. So we went on large animal calls and, and small and got to see the really like yeah. unusual things. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I remember this one call, uh, we went out to see this goat. And we started walking towards the bar. I said, it's up here. I mean, up to the house. So we went to the house. I walked through the kitchen, walked through the living room, and went into the bedroom. And in the bedroom, they had fence and they had hay on the dresser. And it was, it was unbelievable. <laughs> <Say so. laughs> but so there were a lot of experiences like that. Uh, animals that were well cared for, animals not so well cared for. But it was a really good experience, and um, they enhanced it, the education. Part. Absolutely, and, and so then my during my senior year, obviously it's coming time to start thinking about what you're going to do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Back then, if, if if you didn't have a job tied down by let's say January, February, you started getting a little concerned. Not that there weren't jobs. It's just back then people looked to plan ahead and so on, and, and now it's like. Yes, student, what they're going to do? Well, I don't know. I think I'll take the summer off and then I'll think about it. So it's different. At any rate, I, uh, I saw so many cases during that summer that I knew what was wrong. I knew what we could do. I knew we could help that animal. But it was like, oh, euthanize it, doc. You know, you know, I'll put the money in it or this or that. And I decided I didn't go to veterinary school to kill dogs. Um, so I, I was always very good with my hands. I was very good at anatomy, uh, pretty good at physiology. And I thought, well, maybe I think about becoming a surgeon. And so I started looking into that and residencies and so on. And then it was in uh, November of my senior year and the radiologist that we had was named Bob Lewis, fabulous guy. Matter of fact, I replaced him. 
but um, well, it doesn't sound right. He left in '69, and I came in '70. So he, you know, they didn't sure, have anyone. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't like he had to leave or anything. Fabulous teacher, good guy. He came back from a meeting in November, and he said, uh, when I was standing in the interpretation room in radiology, he says, you know, there's a lot of training programs open in, in radiology this year, and it's like, it was an epiphany. And uh, it's, all of a sudden, I was absolutely focused. That's what I wanted to do. And uh, back then, radiology, there weren't residencies in radiology. He just did a master's degree in radiology. So um, I knew from that moment that's what I wanted to do. And um, um, I started looking at the, those different programs. I applied at Texas and I applied at Iowa State. And uh, in Texas, there was someone on their staff that wanted to change from one area to radiology, and so they took him. Well, I, uh, Iowa State needed someone badly, and they, they lowered themselves to take me. <laughs> So I went to Iowa State and uh, got a um, master's degree in radiology. When I when I arrived at uh, at Iowa State, it was, would have been in July. Um, after you got your after you after got my DVM. See, back then we graduated in uh, June, and uh, I turned uh, 24 on June 6 and graduated June 9th. Um, I was one of the youngest in my class. Uh, there was, I think, one, other, one or two other guys that were younger. Were there any days. women in your class? Four. Uh, there were four. We started with four, and uh, three graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those um, married a classmate, and uh, the other two did not. Uh, found out later one of them was lesbian, so <laughs> maybe that was the reason. Could <laughs> be, could be, right. I uh, didn't know that at the time. But... Uh, so after graduation, um, uh, Dr. Lewis, the radiologist, had organized a, a uh, biomechanics course with uh, Dave Van Sickle and uh, Stan Sudarth, I don't remember Stan. And uh, so I took that course, and I worked in radiology working out a technique for the linear tomogram that they just installed. So I got my hands uh, wet early there. And so in July, I went to Iowa State, and the radiologist who was just starting his retirement program left for the summer. Their partial retirement was that you didn't have to work the summer. So I was a radiologist fresh out of primary <laughs> school. And um, it's, I think it's called learning by fire. <laughs> and I, I knew some things, you know, and I was be able to be helpful. I, I uh, I followed as many cases as I could to necropsy to find out what was really there, and so I did learn a lot in that program. And so, in that uh, in that regard, it was very good. So September comes, and he's supposed to come back. He said, "Well, I'm going to Europe." So he gave me some notes as you start teaching the course. I didn't have any slides. I didn't have anything. I had to learn how to make slides so I could show a few images and lecture on things I had to study before I. I could lecture on them. But it worked out. <clears throat> I, uh, I did a, uh, a research project, um, transosseous phlebography with a localization of spinal cord compression and canis familiaris. Sounds highfalutin, but I j basically injected contrast agent in the body of L7, contrast these uh, vertebral venous sinus so we could find out where the swelling was. And back then, see, there weren't, there was not good, there were no good myelographic agents uh, for, for, for finding out where the compressions were. In human medicine, they use a uh, product called Panopake, which is an oil. And uh, there still are people today that have uh, uh, subarachnoid adhesions because of that contrast agent. It was very irritating. In dogs, because their, their subarachnoid space is so thin, it would globulate and you, couldn't, you just couldn't see it very well. So we really needed something, and so I was working on that as a, as a technique. So I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I, I uh, finished my degree, and uh, of course it's time to start looking for uh, employment, <coughs> and I uh, 
Um, Iowa State offered me a position, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, for 13000 a year, and Purdue was open. They had a position, so I thought, well, I better go back and look at Purdue because I, I really liked Purdue. And uh, I, uh, was in, I, I came back, and they had – Bob Lewis left in December of 69, and I was, of course, available in July of 70. And so they didn't have a radiologist during that time. And long and short of it, they were desperate. <laughs> and, and I was the only applicant. <laughs> so it worked out. It worked out. I got the job. Um, uh, you, have you interviewed Jack Fessler yet? Yes. OK, well, Jack, he and I are good friends. And, and uh, he told me later, he says, you know, I wasn't in favor of you coming back, but I guess it worked out okay. <laughs> <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. I liked Jack, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, tell uh, us about you were the hospital chief of diagnostic imaging in the teaching hospital. Yes, I was head of diagnostic imaging. Of course, when you're Did the only radiologist, you have no competition it, there either. Has it has it grown? Had it grown since you've been there? Oh imaging my goodness! Yes. Um, when I when I arrived, it was we had. Uh, uh, one small ammo room and one large ammo room. In the teaching hospitals, and that were okay. Well, it wasn't called teaching hospital. No, yeah. but that, in that area where it's the small ammo. Yeah, and then we we uh, did hand dipping of films for processing. And when I when I uh, was hired, I, I said one of the things I really need to have was an automatic processor. So uh, by uh, around January '71, we we got an automatic processor, but. Um, during my tenure, I more than doubled the, the floor space to radiology. I was managed to keep the uh, traffic pattern reasonable with a, a interpretation room being kind of the hub of a, of a wheel. Uh, we added um, um, scintigraphy, we added uh, ultrasound, and we added CT. Now, since then, they've added MRI since I've... Uh, yeah, I did uh, read that. Yeah. yeah. But um, so all those uh, different procedures were, were added. As a matter of fact, in the late 80s, <coughs> we changed the name of the section from radiology to diagnostic imaging because we were using more sure. uh, more modalities than just radiation. How was the support coming? Did you get some external support for some of this equipment? It's pretty pricey. Yeah. The most recent one, didn't, did St. E's gave you some? Yes. Oh. Uh, well, they 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 donated the uh, four slice CT. Okay. Yeah, and, I did read uh, that. When when I was uh, section chief, we uh, we um, had a contract we're on a pay per view, so we had a company come and put it in, and then we paid them so much for every study that we did. <clears throat> but. Um, what about maintenance on the equipment? Oh, I, I know. I was wanting to tell you about uh, the ultrasound. In 1974, I saw my first real-time ultrasound procedure. It was uh, uh, we, at that time we, we went to the Radiologic Society of North America, which is in Chicago. Real-time ultrasound of the heart. You see the heart beating in the valves. And I was just mesmerized by that. It was just wonderful. What you what you can do? We'll, we'll never be able to afford that. Nine years later, I had my machine. In uh, 1981, the first veterinary ultrasound short course was taught out at Washington State. I was there. It took me two years to raise $65,000 to buy our first machine, and then we went from there. And uh, <clears throat> in 88, I think, I took a three months sabbatic to learn how to do Doppler. We got a new machine that had uh, Doppler. Isn't it just amazing when you think about what you've got available today? Oh man, it's, I mean, it is incredible. It is incredible. Um, and it, it's it so makes it too easy. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. You know, you know, right? And I remember those. They don't use X-ray much in, anymore, do they? Oh do no, they? yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Do you? Yes. Okay. Oh yes, yes. Um, uh, Are hospitals using it as well? Oh, absolutely. Humans? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but see, what's changed there is now it's digital. You know, okay. Rather than film screen. It's digital, uh, so uh, they've enhanced it. In other words, they oh yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Now there's, there's still uh, some places that are using film screen. Matter of fact, uh, um, this spring I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and in the part of the workout 
uh, they had chest films and so on. They produced some film screen that I allowed. And I've, I've since I had the surgery and I'm okay. I, everything was confined and whatnot, yeah. But uh, so um, where were we? When I, when I started at Purdue in 70, I, one of my goals was to become a full professor uh, in 10 years. And I made it in 1980 as a full professor. And uh, at the right old age of 36. <laughs> now, when you then Stockton was the, uh, the dean. Stockton was dean. dean yes. Uh, Erskine was dean when you first came back. He, he was dean. He yeah. Okay. Erskine was dean for about um, I guess that one or two months, and then uh, at that time I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes politically and all that, and apparently there'd been a lot of unhappiness, and um, so then he stepped down and. Uh, Stockton became the interim dean, and then eventually became the sure. dean. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then after that, uh, would have been Hugh Lewis came next, didn't he? I think. Uh, let me think. Let me think. Yes. Yes, Lewis. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I was just thinking the other day. There have been eleven presidents of Purdue. Yeah. I've served under five of them. And there, because I have, when you came, Hubdy was still well. When you were student, Hubdy was still here. And yes. was here till '69 because of the anniversary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and yeah. then um, there, uh, I've served under all of the deans except uh, Pat Hutchins, and I've served under all of the department heads in the clinical area. Isn't that nice? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But there's um, been a lot of different administrative structures in the clinic, and that's changed quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of administration structures across the board. Yeah. <laughs> it changes. When I started, it was uh, there was just <laughs> one department of clinics, small and large, clinical activity, everything together, and, and the uh, actually the clinic supported the, the teaching. Sure. And uh, then they. Um, he divided it into Department of Large Ammo Clinics and Department of Small Ammo Clinics, and of course here I am in the middle. And so I was appointed 50-50 each way, but 80% 80, 80 of my work was in small animal. And uh, so that was interesting. And then they decided to have a teaching hospital in Department of Clinics. And that's, that's basically the structure we have right now. And you know which one of those worked the best? I'll leave it here. I'll let, I'll let you answer that. Well, it's the one with the worst structure, and, there, and that was when I was 50-50 each way. But the reason it worked the best was because of the people we had in charge. People trump structure any day of the sure, week. Sure, exactly. Yeah. I agree. And so... Uh, no matter what, if you got the people to do it, it can, it'll work. It yeah. works. It exactly. So that, that, uh, that was... Uh, Let's talk, uh, can you make a comment about the, your, your consultant, the Veterinary Information mm -hmm. Network? Mm -hmm. researchers. Sure. Now, when did you retire? Well, I retired uh, from the university in um, uh, last June, June, okay. June, July, you know, at the end of the fiscal year. Okay, in 09, huh? In 09. Okay. I was in the... Um, were you in that volunteer, oh, were you? Oh, I yeah, started. I was in okay. the voluntary early retirement program <laughs> for... Um, was it two years or three, mm -hmm. you think? It's okay. I can't remember. That's all right. That's okay. I think it was three years. Okay. I think it was three years. That's right. It was three years. I was 50% uh, appointment for two years. And in that last year, I asked to drop down to 10%. And then um, I'd always planned to, uh, to stay on for 40 years of service. And all of a sudden, I realized that no one else really cared whether it was 40 or 39. And all of a sudden, I didn't either. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and and I, I remember <coughs> many years ago they were doing some long range planning and and they printed out all of the uh, the faculty with the year that they will turn sixty five you know as a just a date to pick to talk about turnover and that sort of thing and I remembered. Uh, one of the younger, younger faculty members told me, he said, well, at least you're on the second page, you know. <laughs> and I was thinking, and I thought then that I would probably stay until at least I was 70. My how things change. 
your, your attitudes about things change a lot. So I, uh, um, w when I went from 50% to 10%, mainly I needed another day of the week so I could do some outside consulting. Uh, I was working uh, in Indianapolis uh, twice a week. Well, they, I was working there one day a week, and they wanted me twice a week. And <clears throat> I had some other venues in South Bend, Elkhart, and in, in uh, Greenwood that I would go in and, and, and help them with imaging and do ultrasound studies and that sort of thing. And the outside um, always pays much better than the inside, you know what I mean. And uh, so I did that, and then... Um, when I when I retired completely from the university, mm -hmm. I continued going to Indianapolis and doing those. I started dropping. I dropped Elkhart and in, in South Bend because it was just too far. And it's because you have to drive back and forth. I to drive. Sure. Yeah. What I do, I would drive up there the night before and get a motel because it used to be I'd drive th three hours up, work all day, three hours back, and uh, that wears pretty thin as you get older. You, you, you know, you lose your suppleness. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> and you're when right. you're yeah. sitting in the car that long, it's like, oh man. So I dropped that, and then I, and then I, uh, eventually had to drop uh, Greenwood, and then stayed with the center because they had CT and really nice ultrasound, and then, and and that was only two days a week. So I, I could do this, and eventually I, the road trip was more than I wanted to do. And I've been working with Ben. Better Information Network, and I knew that I had opportunity to, to, to make that grow, and I realized that I could do that mainly from home. So I uh, approached the president, and he said, yeah, let's do it. So then I uh, uh, got off the road last December. Better Information Network was started in 1991, and... Um, it was a very small uh, kind of an indexing you know, where, where they took data and made it available. They didn't really have that much consulting uh, uh, on it. And as it grew, of course, there's more and more, they got more and more consultants involved and they developed message boards. And I joined them in 2000 as a, uh, as a uh, consultant. And um, they, um, I would just do it whenever I had time, and I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I enjoyed the interaction. And the, the nice thing about it was that now is more global, and I'm talking to people, you know, basically all over the world, and that, that was very intriguing. One thing is really interesting: I was on the faculty for 39 years and never saw a case of Spirocercolupi. That is a parasite that infests the esophagus in dogs. And I'd been taught about it, and I knew what it looked like radiographically. I never saw one. It's common in Israel. And so I'm seeing all these cases now, Spirocerca loopy through Ben. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, when you practice in an area long enough, um, if you know where the animal's coming from, you know what diseases they get exposed to. For example, if excuse me, just say, if if an animal comes from Dayton, Indiana, and it's not on heartworm preventative, it's got heartworm disease. It's just so common there. Um, Northwest Indiana, Par uh, Paragamus kilicati is a common parasite. Uh, blastomycosis, north northern part of the state. Histoplasmosis, central part of the state, southern Indiana, histo and blasto. I mean, so you just you just know what those diseases are going to. They just come into that particular. Yeah, area. if you look at the address, well, it's more likely this because of where they're from. Sure. So you can use that geographic information. Well, on Vin, I don't know what's in Hong Kong, or I don't, you know, I, I know that some of the uh, some of the countries where tuberculosis is a little more common, and we don't see it here but you do see it other places. So it, you have to open up your thinking to you know, the worldwide right. disease community. What's unique so, or what, what in that area? What, yeah. what is ca the causative agent sure. for the disease? Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So... Um, um, That's been a nice deal for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, right. it's really excellent because I can 
Uh, well, I fly to California every so often to put on short courses, and, and I'm going to be doing a uh, teaching a, uh, uh, a course online starting in end of August. It's really a unique experience because I haven't done this quite before. I'm going to record the lectures on, uh, digitally, and then we can do digital editing of it. We can then, uh, when, the, when the course is going on, I can watch the, the playing, and I can, I can post questions, and there's, there's a thing called Unity where it's a little side box where people can ask a question and I can answer it while the lecture's going on. And um, then after, say, this first week's lecture, there is a thread that's open and <clears throat> uh, where people can post questions and I can post quizzes so people can quiz themselves, and then we have the next lecture, and it goes on for six weeks that way. The other beautiful thing about this is that now, because everything's digitally recorded, we can set it up so someone who wants to take it in Australia, who can't take it when we're doing it live, can still sign up for the course, can, can listen to the lectures, take the quizzes, and then post individual questions during that next week because it's off only, you know, about a, what is it, 18 hours, I think, something like that. So they can get their questions answered before the next lecture. Oh, that's great. And Isn't that's, it amazing? That's an opportunity you don't have in, in, a, in a university right now. No, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about um, some awards. You got the Outstanding Teaching Award from the school in 2007, and also you were a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Radiology. And... The Ultrasound Society, the first president. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I've also been president of the American College of Veterinary Radio. Do you still keep active in, in those? Yes. Do yes, you? I am. Matter of fact, I am setting up a uh, chat room right now for the Veterinary Ultrasound Society through through them using their infrastructure. Super. Yeah. But, um, well, as far as the awards, I mean, people don't do what they do for awards, but they're always very nice. They're nice. Yeah. It's not, recognition is mm -hmm. nice to have. Yeah, you know, exactly. And... Uh, so I, uh, what was really special about the Plu Award, uh, the person, uh, Ray Plu, who gave the money, was a classmate of mine. And what was, he, Ray was a, uh, let's say when we, were, when we were freshmen and sophomores and so on, he, he uh, let's just say he really enjoyed life. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, he had a good time. And... He rode a motorcycle, still does actually, but he'd just get fed up and take off his motorcycle. He got picked up one time in Louisiana for vagrancy, and we half class had to chip together to get some money. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Billy Hooper took him under his wings and really you know, jerked a knot in his tail. And he turned around. He married uh, one of the secretaries over there, and she was a very good influence on him. He went to George, I think, got a PhD. He was always very bright, but he never did well in school because he didn't apply right. himself. Didn't apply himself. So um, he um, did really well. He, he uh, worked for um, Merck, I think it was, and, and actually worked his way up in that company to uh, one of the administrators, and he was doing very well. And he gave some stock to the school uh, for this award, and it was because of Billy Hooper, I mean, and, and he, 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 he made he, the parameters for that. He wanted someone like Billy Hooper to, you know, to get this award, someone who uh, was good at teaching and uh, looked after students and all that sort of thing. So I was very pleased to win that award because I knew what the thinking was behind it. Right, and you knew the, the person. Yeah, Which exactly. Is nice. It's a classic. Exactly. That's nice to be with mm -hmm. you guys. Yeah, he was actually at the award ceremony when I got it, so oh, it was kind of nice. That's good. He, he rode his motorcycle up from, <laughs> from uh, St. Louis, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you had a lot of hobbies, you know, archery and music. You still keep active with those? Um, yes, of? I. Well, I'm so busy. It's, I know. Music is hard to, to right. stay good at it. I, I, can, I play a lot of different instruments. Uh, as you know, I, I, earlier I uh, started on brass instruments and then I when I was in college and later part of the latter part of my uh, high school career I started playing stringed instruments when I played brass instruments I had to read the music when I started playing stringed instruments I played by ear so I play you know guitar and lap dulcimer hammer dulcimer uh, auto harp a little bit of banjo uh, then I got into some of the 
mouth organs. I play uh, uh, penny whistle and juice harp and, and uh, uh, nose flute. You ever, <laughs> have you ever heard of a nose flute? <laughs> no. It's like you blow it with your nose and you use your mouth as a resonating changer to change the notes. That's interesting. It's really... Uh, I'll have to come out in one of your performances so, sometime. So, I don't do performances. <laughs> I just I play home, for fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, I enjoy, uh, enjoy the music. Uh, I, this, well, when was it? It was Christmas. I played the auto harp for a, uh, for a performance at our local church. Uh, we we go to Armstrong Chapel. Right. And How about a uh, Purdue Traditions? Yeah, Purdue one. Traditions. Yeah, one, well, um, I guess the, um, you know, Purdue Pete, the big dr bass drum, those you know, are special to me and the, and the, and the special. Uh, there's one tradition that I was really, really upset that they dropped uh, was the Griffin. Uh, and what made it worse was when I found out they paid some consulting company like $125,000 or something to come up with this Purdue. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Different, I know. I, I was, I was un, uh, unamused. I got a clock that's a uh, chiming clock. It has the old seal on it, you know. Mm -hmm. I really like it. It's yeah. got Indiana cherry. It's really nice. Yeah. How about an outstanding event? An outstanding event? If well, you have any. Or you can have more than one. Well, let's see. Uh, I love Purdue football, you know, and I was uh, I was there when Bob Greasy uh, hit uh, Hadrick in the end zone with, a, with no time left on the clock uh, to win, beat Illinois at our homecoming, and that was the year we we uh, won the Rose Bowl. Yeah, so that was uh, very special. Um, I don't know, I. I Think about why. Why did I, you know, come back to Purdue? Uh, I think it's because I loved it so much. That's nice. And in your empowering talk about and well, anything. Uh, learning begins when you don't know the answer. So I'll leave the closing comments to you. What radiology, imaging, and what well, whatever you'd like, or you know something that, I forgot to ask. That that quote. That's that's me. I know. That's, that's great. Quote. I think yeah. that's a wonderful thing. And the re the reason behind that is that. As I'm sitting there teaching students, uh, mainly in the senior year, and asking questions, and everybody is so afraid. And you know, the to other to ask a question. Well, to answer my questions because they're afraid they might be wrong. And I, and I tell them, I can't teach you what you already know. I can only teach you what you don't know. And for me to be able to, to interact with you and teach. I have to know what you don't know, and I have to find that out by questions. And if you don't know the answer, great, I got you right where I want you. Right, good. And now, and now I can teach you something. Right. And and the other thing that I always tried to teach, and I feel like I was totally unsuccessful at, and I tried to get the administrators to understand this, is that no one can intimidate you unless you give them permission to do so. And I've been accused of being intimidating. And that's never my intent. I mean, you don't intimidate me. This environment doesn't intimidate me, but that's because you don't have my permission to intimidate me. And I tried to teach the students that same thing. And I, I was very unsuccessful it's at that. It's hard, it is, yeah. Um, but you're gonna keep, uh, keeping busy with, and that network is just really nice. And yes, it is, and that's probably, be my, I'm not sure when I will quit that, or if I ever will. Yeah. I and told, now with this I digital told and the, the uh, online, you I, just go as long as you I, want. I told the uh, president of that company, I said, uh, I'll get off Venn when I, uh, <clears throat> I'm dead. Uh, I can't see, because I need to be able to see, or no one wants my opinion anymore. <laughs> Those are the three things that caused me to leave. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Bowens, I want to thank you very much. This is really very nice.